Today I thought I'd talk to you about some of the various books that I've got on historical costume and which ones are reliable, which ones are less reliable, which ones I find useful and what I find them useful for. I've got too many books to do this in one video. The ones I'll be looking at today are all sort of overviews of historical clothing as a whole, so looking at it through broad swathes of time. Well, not all clothing, because most of them are very Western centric. As such, they don't really have patterns or how to make the clothing in them. They are purely sort of what do the clothes look like and how did they change in appearance um, and what they were made of. So they are useful for how to put together an outfit from a, well, some of them are useful for how to put together an outfit from a specific period of time or how to recognise clothing in period dramas or even extant pieces of clothing, how to work out what time period it's from. These are all secondary sources, they're all written after the time period that they're dealing with and they're all written taking into account both other secondary sources as well as some primary sources, though some use more primary sources than others as we shall see. Primary sources are things that were written at the time, so like letters and diaries and newspapers and extant dresses and all that sort of thing. All of the things, well, most of the things I'm going to be saying in this video are my opinion and they may not hold true for everyone. Different people are going to have different views on different books depending on what they're using them for. So don't necessarily take my opinion as gospel. What I would say is just question everything. Question where they're getting their information from. So lots of the older um, question books from uh, the 19th century and early 20th century are not the most reliable because they don't include footnotes. They don't tell us where they got their information from, which funnily enough, isn't massively useful for trying to track down why they're saying certain things about different pieces of clothing. So generally speaking, more recent books are more reliable than older books, but that's not to say that older books don't have a use at all. But yes, question everything, even primary sources, it's worth questioning why they were produced or why they've survived until today. So even just looking at garments in museums, for example, those that will have survived will have survived for a reason, uh, be it because they were of sentimental value, because they were a wedding dress, because they were particularly valuable. We don't have many examples of poorer people's clothing in museums, for example, because of the fact that it wouldn't be kept, um, they just wear them to rags. So if we only took extant garments in museums into account when studying historical costume or historical clothing, we'd have a very, very biased view of what everyone wore 300 years ago. And with that, we'll start looking at all of these different books. So this first one is Costume and Fashion in Colour. So it's looking at a fairly broad swathe of um, clothing. It was published in 1971, reprinted in 1976. So it's not the most recent of books. It does, to its credit, have a list of the sources for all of its illustrations at the back, which is useful because it then means that you can go to one of the illustrations in the front of the book and establish how he's drawn it, where he's drawn it from. To take this one, for example, that colour of purple in 1765 would have been hideously, hideously expensive, and so not many people could afford it. It does also, at the beginning, list sources of information. It doesn't have a massive list, and as such, um, between that and the fact that it was published in 1971, lots of the information in it won't be as up-to-date. But also it's worth bearing in mind that this isn't really an academic book, so it might be that you find a thing of interest in here and you're then able to go back to it and look at it in more detail. It's nice to start off somewhere, um, even if it's in a little book like this. This next book, The Chronicle of Western Costume, is arguably less useful than the previous book. Where the other book had some coloured illustrations, this one has lots. It's essentially a chronology of about 4,000 years of history, I think. 
don't know if that's what the description is. It's kind of useful in a broad chronological overview when it comes to silhouettes, but I do have some issues with it. It's got a bibliography which, given that this was published in 1991, for the most part they are fairly early books. Um, some of them are good books, but it's Janet Arnold and Nora War and people. Where the other one cited the paintings where, uh, of paintings, paintings, fashion plates, all that sort of thing, where it found the costumes that it illustrated. This one doesn't. It does give descriptions of all of the individual items of clothing um, and what each of the people are wearing. However, from this um, English Queen, for example, um, English Queen circa 1592. The only English Queen around 1592 was, funnily enough, Elizabeth I. And I think this is the Ditchley portrait of her. The one where she's standing on a big map, anyway. It's sort of like he's looked at it, but hasn't looked at it quite closely enough. The proportion of the trimmings across the dress isn't quite right. And then where it's got the, it's got the stomacher and then it's got the sort of turned back collar over the gown that's going over the top of the stomacher and the petticoat. And it doesn't show that as a turned back collar, it just seems to be an integral part of whatever this bodice thing is that she's wearing. When in the portrait, it, there's a turned back collar and then you can see a bit of the red of the gown um, behind it in the same way that there's the red of the gown on the sleeves and the red of the gown on the skirt, but you wouldn't know that from looking at this image and there's no way really of being able to go back and look at the originals of any of these images. Uh, he does state in the introduction to this that some of his drawings are based on an amalgamation of several portraits or fashion plates so as to fit more in, uh, but it would still be nice to know what the sources were that he used and be able to go back to them. Another thing that I have an issue with is it's a complete mess in terms of geography and in terms of people's rank. So we've sort of got Italian lady, English lady, German knight, Spanish girl, German lady. The issue with mixing up geography, mixing up geography? I mean, I get geography mixed up all the time, but the issue with mixing up clothing is that it leads to the illusion that all people across Europe were wearing all of these different sorts of things at the same time which I don't think is what is intended by this book because he does, to his credit, label all of the different countries that the garments are coming from. But if you're looking at a specific time period but not necessarily looking at a specific place, you can end up a bit like the other Blin girl did with very German fashions on very English queens, which wouldn't have happened at all and doesn't quite fit, but never mind. It's something to be aware of with books like this that are covering all different countries and all different classes all at once is that you're going to have a sort of mess, really. Uh, the other thing that I have an issue with is that the context in which the clothing is worn isn't always stated. So back in the early 17th century, we've got these two women here that you might be a little bit familiar with from the video that I did on embroidered 17th century waistcoats or jackets. As you can see, they've both got a sort of great big drapery bedsheet thing draped across one of their shoulders. This was not daily wear. This is what women would wear if they're going to a mask. So this is sort of dressing up wear. You wouldn't go around day to day. You wouldn't go to the shops wearing a great big velvet curtain draped over one shoulder. Anyway, that's that book. It's nice for inspiration if you want to do history bounding or fantasy stuff. The drawings are very pretty, but I wouldn't use it too much as inspiration for a specific costume. So this book, Fashion Details, a historical source book, you have to be really careful with because you can trust the writing but you can't necessarily trust the pictures. The nice thing about this, unlike the last couple of books, it hasn't just been written by one person, it's got a whole host of different people who are writing it, who are experts in various different things. So most of them are curators and academics. There's one specialises on Chinese fashion, for example. There's another one who's a curator of Japanese art. So these are people who know what they're talking about. The other advantage it has is it doesn't just deal with Western costume. It does deal with a lot of Western costume, but there's clothing from Asia, India, Persia, Africa, Australia, New Zealand, Polynesia, America, and it does have more European dress, but it does at least touch on clothing across the world. 
which is good because most costume books don't seem to acknowledge that there is any world outside of Europe and maybe possibly America if we're going that modern. Um, but yes, America didn't really exist until the uh, colonies turned up, if you trust the clothing in most costume books. But anyway, that's a separate issue entirely. So all of the images in this book are 19th century, so they're not necessarily the most trustworthy, but they are quite interesting from the point of view of the history of the history of fashion. The colour is what looked pretty rather than what was really there. There's so much purple and we're in the 16th century, but anyway. Um, aside from that, it's quite useful in terms of the writing. We've got a massive bibliography just after the glossary. So they've looked at lots and lots of different um, sources and lots of these are quite modern works. So this is really up to date. So it's got a good bibliography. It's got a huge glossary which is really useful when beginning to learn terminology. The nice bit at the back is that it deals specifically with headwear and hairstyles and accessories as well. Much like the other two, it's a useful jumping off point but because it's got more up-to-date terminology and because it's got more reliable writing, it's then easier to go and look for um, any of the items of clothing that you might want to look in more depth at. Uh, this next book is English Costume, which is by Doreen Yarwood. So this is one of the ones that was referenced in um, the Chronicle of Western Costume. So this is a somewhat older book. It was first published in 1952. It's intended to be a general but comprehensive study, but it's the illustrations are quite useful in that it gives different views of um, not just dresses, but also individual items of clothing like shoes and rings and jewellery and hats and that sort of thing. And I do especially like the illustrations of French coats from various paintings because it gives side views as well as front views, which are always slightly more difficult to get and I really need to make myself a new French coat at some point. Again, question what it tells you. So for example here, velvet was still the most popular gown material, either plain or patterned with brocade, satin, silk and damask as alternatives. Well the first issue with that is that silk isn't a type of weave of fabric, silk is just a fibre, so I'm not sure what sort of silk she means there. Secondly, where are her sources for this? If velvet, like the Tudor tailor nowadays has nice pie charts of um, what garments were made of, or what garments were worn, or what colour garments were from various different wills and inventories, and being able to sort of amalgamate all of that together to establish that, I don't know, red was the most popular colour for petticoats in such and such a year. Or through most of the 16th century really, but anyway. It doesn't really give any footnotes, and sort of, the girdle was costly as ever. Well, how much money is that? Is that a day's wage for a labourer or is that sort of three months wage for a skilled craftsman? It's all a bit vague. It does have a bibliography, but of course because it's a book that was written originally in the 1950s, it's all fairly old scholarship that she's relying on, so it's not really... As with everything, question everything. Not everything in this book will be completely incorrect. Uh, but there will probably be lots of space for slightly dodgy information. So again, it's a nice overview, it's nice to look into the costume, and I do quite like the little line drawings. It's difficult to tell where she got her information from, which isn't brilliant. Um, not being able to trace back the pictures, I personally find really, really frustrating. This, as you can probably tell, is another fairly old um, so it's History of Fashion, a visual survey of costume from ancient times to the present day by Douglas Gorsline. When was it published? 1953. So this one's even older than the last one. So, so much like all of the other ones, he split the book up into different periods. So once again, beginning with ancient Egypt, a bit like John Peacock was. Part of the issue is that... Oh look, Martin Luther. Um, not all of these people are specified as being from a particular place, especially in things like the headgear. It's nice in labelling some bits and then just seems to forget to label other bits, which is just really frustrating. Um, that's a drastically simplified version of Elizabeth's petticoat in that portrait, but never mind, I wouldn't envy him in having to draw all of those animals really small. 
One thing that I will say for this book is that it has an absolutely massive bibliography. It does also provide a list of sources. Uh, annoyingly, lots of them, annoyingly, sort of annoyingly, lots of them are from, uh, well, the photographs especially are from the author's own collection, which means that it's not exactly easy to go and have a look for. Oh, there's more bibliography there. He does also refer back to Rastane a lot, who is one of the artists for this book. So that's not massively reliable, so that's worth bearing in mind. He does at least provide a list of where he found the sources. I think this one's probably better than John Peacock in terms of an overview of historical fashion covering much the same time period and doing much the same mess of geography and uh, a blank but at least he does provide all of the sources uh, that he's taken all of these images from and also it's in black and white so he hasn't really messed up the colours because you can't when it's in black and white moving on to some slightly less picturey books this is the golden thread by cassia st Clair. i think this spans the biggest amount of time of all of the different books that i'm looking at i think something like thirty thousand years uh, so from the very origins of fibres and fabrics and spinning um, through the Egyptians, the silk in China, the silk roads, Vikings, um, medieval, all the way up to um, the moon landing and the materials that we use there, uh, sports fabrics and even spider silk. So rather than looking at the history of dress, this is far more the history of fabric. It's really useful for the context in which clothes were being worn and are being worn. So yeah, it's absolutely fascinating. Um, even the modern, modern, more modern areas, looking at sort of rayon um, being manufactured in France when Nazis were occupying it, which was very horrific. So it's fascinating just as a history of fabric and fibre and the context in which it was made and used. I got this from a charity shop a while back, but I think I, I think you can listen to this in Audible as well, which is good. In a similar way, this um, Back in Fashion, it's another academic book, it's another really, really recent book. Rather than going through different styles of fashion, um, like some of the books of the picture we looked at earlier, uh, it goes more through a street of the Western world, through the lens of fashion. It starts in the Middle Ages and goes all the way up to now. And it sort of looks at different themes, so um, how fashion sort of came about in the Middle Ages, and then later on looking at shopping centres and how fashion was consumed, how fashion was perceived, and how fashion affected the world and how the world affected fashion in terms of things like sportswear and trade and women's emancipation, rational dress movement, all that sort of thing. Again, it's another really fascinating book with very pretty pictures in, which always helps to make books more appealing. Yes, that is a book that I'd very much recommend if you want context around um, historical costume and historical fashion. So The Corset is another book that deals with a specific aspect of fashion. In this book, funnily enough, it deals with the corset. So it deals with how the corset came about, where it came from, where it was thought to come from, so sort of the history of the history of corsets, and how they were made, how they are perceived, what the different arguments were surrounding corsets, who wore them, how they were advertised. It's a far more nuanced look at corsets than a lot of other earlier works arguably are. So there are some women that really didn't like wearing corsets, there are other women that really did. Um, there are others that just saw them as an item of clothing, much like nowadays a bra is just an item of clothing. It debunks a lot of corset myths, like those of the ribs being removed and that sort of thing. And funnily enough, the bibliography is absolutely massive. Um, that's only the selected bibliography. It's a really interesting book looking at the history of the corset and the history of the perception of the corset as well. Again, it's hideously expensive online at the moment, so I borrowed this one from a friend. Costume in Detail by Nancy Bradfield. 
Again, it's borrowed from a friend because it's really expensive online at the moment, so I can't afford it. Rather than drawings, like the other books were, of um, drawings of drawings, drawings of photographs, drawings of illustrations, this is drawings of excellent garments. I find it really, really useful because as well as the drawings of the different garments, it then gives different measurements of them. So while it doesn't give patterns on how to make the garments, it still gives a very good idea of what sort of dimensions you can expect and what they were made of and how they were decorated and when they'd be worn. And because some of them have quite good provenances, you can then tell who wore them and when they wore them and how old they were and all that sort of thing. It goes through all manner of different items of clothing. It looks at underwear as well as the outerwear and it also gives diagrams of the interior of dresses as well. So looking at the boning and the waist tapes and the absolutely massive pockets and the frills and the stiffening and how the seams are finished and lots of really really useful stuff for how to make clothes. I really recommend this one even though it's not the most recent of books. So moving on to some books with extant garments pictured in them. This is Fashion History um, from the 18th to 20th century from the Kyoto Costume Institute. Um, it's really useful in giving lots of images of both the back and front of various different garments. Where I take slight issue with it is in some cases it gives a detailed image of a dress and then an image of the entire dress. However, in other circumstances, like this one, that's all the picture there is of this ball round. There aren't any other images of any other parts of it, which is slightly frustrating, but I suppose if they gave pictures of all the different parts of the dresses, it would be a huge book. Again, these two dresses, um, there's just the sleeve blouses. There's, there's nothing else. But anyway, it's a really pretty book. It's, it's fairly accessible in that it's got lots of just little pieces of writing here and there about the different dresses. Um, which is useful. It, it goes quite a long way into the 20th century. There are some seriously weird items of clothing later on, especially. Um, I'm not quite sure why and where that is, but never mind. It does give the odd painting alongside a dress to give slightly more context into how it would have been worn, which I also really like. I think lots of them can be looked up online, but because it doesn't seem to give the museum numbers for them, then I like this book, it's a really lovely, accessible, inspiration-y book for pick a period and then have a look and see the pretty, pretty dresses from that period. Not that 1830s dresses are particularly pretty, but never mind. I think I said pretty dresses and I meant on slightly more hideous ones, so perhaps I'm just a bit biased. Anyway, uh, in a similar vein to the Kyoto Costume Institute ones, the v have two books. Um, there's historical fashion in detail and 19th century fashion in detail. So historical fashion in detail is 17th and 18th centuries. Rather than being watched chronologically, the, um, the historical fashion in detail, for example this one, it's according to different techniques that you use when making all of these different garments. So it's quilting, folding, um, slashing, picking, stamping. It sort of jumps around all over the place, but it gives a detailed picture of part of the garment rather than all of the garment, and then a line drawing of it. In some cases, like this match here, it gives um, where the right side and the wrong side of the fabric are, and sort of all the pleats and the different things, which can be quite useful for the making of different dresses. But what it does do is give a um, museum number for the garment, so it's then fairly easy to go to the VA website, look it up and see the entire garment and all the different pictures. Yes, uh, like I said earlier, line drawings can be quite useful for just seeing the detail without getting distracted by the pretty patterns and embroidery and that sort of thing. Anyway, um, 19th century fashion in detail is arranged in a slightly similar way. So, um, Thematically speaking, rather than looking at the different um, techniques used, it instead looks at sort of the male image, historicism, romantic styles, exoticism, innovations, construction details, and the natural world. 
So with the male image, it both deals with men's clothing, like these trousers, and then women's clothing, like this riding jacket, which I think Isabella Pitcher's made an absolutely amazing um, reproduction of. And then historicism um, is fun because it's sort of like history bounding, but Victorians doing history bounding. So there's the sort of obvious neoclassicism, and then there's the um, Liberty dresses, which are sort of looking back to medievalness-ish kind of, and then drapey loop over skirts and lace and trimmings and ruchings and um, frilly sleeve bits because the 18th century became very fashionable. And then with knights charging around on white coat, which is quite fun as well. And then innovations there's sewing machines so much more trim to things and there's the weird ventilated corsets five toed smocks five five toed socks um, yes doctor theater who didn't think that anyone should, should wear anything except wool which wool corsets so would be compensable um, some of the garments are repeated several times because it's moving thematically which means that they can talk about the historicism of this bodice, for example, and then have a look at the inside of it and how it was constructed with all the different bones. Um, so yes, I really like these two B&A books, mainly because they're pretty, but also they're really, really useful for having a look at close-up pictures. What I will say that I probably shouldn't is that the B&A well, website has loads and loads of pictures on it anyway, so if you can't afford, like I can't afford these books, I've got them from a friend, um, it, you can go onto the VNA website and while it won't necessarily have all of the information that these books have in them, they still often have a lot of information with the garments as well as lots and lots and lots of pictures of them. So the jackets, um, the waistcoat, jacket, bodice, whatever you want to call them, that I've been looking at recently, the VNA has lots and lots and lots and lots of images of those. It's just a rabbit hole, it's a wonderful rabbit hole to go down. Finally, I've got this book, which is fashion. It's not necessarily the most academic of books, but as an overview of dress, it's amazing. It covers a massive time period, much like all of the others, ancient world all the way to the present day. It's hugely, hugely varied, so it takes paintings, engravings, woodcuts, caricatures, uh, all sorts of things of the time and puts together lots of them all in one go. It also looks at the excellent garments, so it will take a case study, it will label all of the different aspects of the dress, and then it looks in detail at various parts of it. Obviously that's fairly, fairly easy to do once you hit the 18th century, and you've got lots of excellent garments, well, lots of, a fair few excellent garments floating around. Um, however, earlier on, obviously it's slightly more difficult to get hold of excellent garments. So instead, what they do is they have reproductions of garments. Something that's worth questioning, of course, is who made the reproductions and did they know what they were doing? Sarah Thursfield has made this one, and there's a medieval dress somewhere. I think she's made it as well. So Sarah Thursfield has herself written uh, The Medieval Tailor's Assistant, which is an excellent book if you want to make medieval clothes because it gives you patterns and context and how different things were made. So arguably she knows what she's doing when it comes to reconstructions. So it treats these reconstructions in much the same way as it does the extant garments, um, looking at different aspects of them and then looking at the detail as well. The other thing that this book does, which I really like, is it looks at individual, it calls them fashion icons, so um, even really, really early on. It, will sometimes give a couple of pages over to a specific person and their life and how they adapted or changed or influenced fashion in a certain way. So there's Beau Brummel who was one of the first dandies who was sort of anti-macarons. And there's Marie Antoinette and Madame de Pompadour and all sorts of people. It's not an academic work, but if you're looking for a way into historical fashion, then I'd say of all of these books, if you want a massive overview of all of historical fashion, this is definitely one of the best books to get into it. Like with everything else, question things, compare it to other things that you know, 
one of the things that does mildly frustrate me is it doesn't cite where all of these different um, portraits are from. At the back it's got this reference area where you can have a look at how different weaves worked. Um, slightly frustratingly, while it does deal with um, various uh, people in traditional dress, it doesn't deal with anything outside from Western fashion, so it does feel a little bit like everyone outside of Europe is just a footnote, but it's still useful in terms of giving all of these different definitions of all of these different terms. Um, so a bit like John Peacock did, but even more so. Um, even just all the different terminologies for fleets and necklines and yeah, the brilliant reference section at the back can be really useful if you're getting into sewing and aren't quite sure what all the different terms mean. And it does go into detail at the back of evolution of bags, purses, hats, shoes. Um, broad sweep of men's wear and women's wear. No bibliography, annoyingly, but if you're wanting one good book as an overview of fashion, then I'd recommend this one. Anyway, hopefully this was useful. There shall probably be more videos on this subject because I've got books on embroidery and books of patterns and books of specific um, time periods in dress. And I think I've got books of portraits as well, which I might I might do a video on portraits at some point. Anyway, hopefully this was video. Hopefully this was video. Hopefully this was useful. I can talk English. Hopefully this was useful. Let me know what you think of it. Um, I will try and do some more at some point, but now I probably ought to go and panic size some clothes for Kent while giving you that's less than two, fewer than two, less than two, fewer than less. It's not very long away and I don't have a doublet bodice at the moment. It's in multiple parts spread across. Well, I found the sleeves in my desk drawer the other day. Anyway, I will go and do that. Uh, you can go and have a look at any of the sources that I've left down below. I've probably left a link for the V&A website down below. And I shall go and start sewing a doublet bodice.